It's really a process that is so complex. I don't really think one person or just one researcher can really encapsulate the whole story. When you say trafficking, I think most people in America think sex trafficking. And I think that there's this glorified horror to sex work that isn't applied yet to labor. These snakeheads have a lot riding on these kids. When there's that much money at stake, they want to make sure that the kids are out there working and paying it back. There's a huge amount of exploitation. And the journeys that people undertake are dangerous journeys. People die en route. And when they arrive here, they can often be held at gunpoint until they pay off the balance of their fees. This is close to a billion dollar business. There are so many people making money from this every year. There are people who you could go and see and you could pay them to get you from point A to point B. And if you didn't have a passport, if you didn't have a visa, uh, that wasn't a problem. We have to walk until 10, then we close the restaurant, and then we take a shower, we came down, and then we cook something to eat. Just work, sleep, eat, work, sleep, eat. She said she first started realizing that this wasn't okay when American families would bring in their kids to the restaurant, and she had to wait on like other 14-year-old kids that were eating there. And it was the first time she realized that she should be able to have a childhood and deserved having a childhood as well. I got a call from her, absolutely terrified, saying, the snakeheads know I was moved. And this was absolutely shocking and really, really terrifying to me because we had had her case basically sealed in the court. It's a no-brainer. If you're a drug smuggler and you have that logistical network, why not go into the people smuggling trade? Why not go into the snakehead trade? The profit margins are just as high. The penalties if you're caught are much, much lower. And the other thing is, your merchandise can walk. Traditionally described as eight parts mountain, one part water, and one part farmland, Fujian province sits along the southeastern coast of China. With a population of 36.2 million people, its chief exports include mechanical and electrical products, automatic data processing equipment, textiles, garments, and footwear. But beyond these, there is one export that has reached the ports of nearly every major city in the world. People. I think that when you're talking about a trafficking scenario, it's not about the work. It's about the psychological coercion, the conditions placed around your work, the, the sacrifices that you're made to take and the lack of control you have over your whole life. I think that that is what makes trafficking trafficking. How did you find out that you'll be coming to America? <laughs> Tasamasiwan and how did that make you feel? Most of the Chinese youth that I work with, they were actually sent to the United States from their parents. They tend to be victims of abuse when they're growing up, or especially victims of neglect as well. And it's actually the parents' idea that they come to the U.S. with snakeheads and be involved in these indentured servitude, debt bondage trafficking scenarios. This is Fujian, China. You're, you're talking to kids that have grown up in a social network that is deeply, deeply rooted in this sense of filial piety. It's very, very unlikely that the child is going to say no. And so people take that to mean consent. In 
，他们就说我在中国没有什么就是作为，没有什么前途，然后就让我来美国。因为我在上学的时候，他们就讲过了，然后我就以为是那种，就以为他们随便说说的。然后他们说要我去美国，然后就说。我不想去，我要待在家里。然后他就，他们就生气，然后就说：“你不去的话，你就不要当我女儿了，我就不让你了。” I might ask a kid, "Did you have a choice?" They'll be like, "My parent asked me. If you talk to them more, they'll say they asked me, but it's not as if I had any say in the matter at all. Asking means going." In an area like Fujian Province, what started happening is you had people who had lived as neighbors in a little village for centuries. This was not the poorest part of China. It's never been the poorest part of China. But suddenly, one family in the village is doing much better, and uh, they get a refrigerator. Everybody else in the village is suddenly looking at them and wondering, well, why are they doing better? And this income disparity is actually what drives people to leave. It's sort of the recognition that there is something else, something beyond what you've had. During the California gold rush of the mid-1800s, Chinese laborers migrated to the U.S. in search of their fortune often borrowing large sums of money to fund their journey. Over a hundred years later, modern smugglers known as snakeheads have developed this system into a worldwide clandestine industry that has transported thousands of Chinese migrants to the United States. Historically, this system has been used to transport adults, but more recently, it has been used to smuggle children. During my first interview with my client, we were talking about how she arrived in the United States. And she kept saying this one word. She was like, shoto. I was like, shoto? What? I don't know, shoto. It sounds just like the word for rock in Chinese. So I had no idea what she was saying. I remember looking in the dictionary. I have a dictionary. I remember being like, sha, which sha? Oh, snake, toe, head, snake head. What is that? I ended up going home and asking my mother if she had ever heard of this term. My mom said, yeah, that's snakeheads. Those are these people who basically smuggle people in. As I got more and more Chinese clients, it became very clear that this was a pattern that was happening in the U.S. These brokers emerged in Southeast China, these people who became known as snakeheads, and they were um, almost like travel agents, like illicit travel agents. They were people who you could go and see and you could pay them to get you from point A to point B. And if you didn't have a passport or you didn't have a visa, uh, that wasn't a problem. I think a snakehead is an interchangeably used term. We're not talking about people that have business cards that say, Mr. Wong, snakehead. Um, it's really how the children identify them. Sertou,他们就是，呃，了解的并不是很多，但是我知道的是，他们，呃，会首先他们会拿走你的护照，呃，他们可能会拿去签证什么的，但是不是签签到美国这边，他们可能会签到另外一个国家，比如说厄
and a lot of the snakeheads began uh, running a slightly more logistically complex operation. And at that point, uh, the fees, the, the prices went up. Um, and law enforcement was beginning to catch on in various countries, and so they developed these really sophisticated networks where they had contacts really all over the world. Right now, the debt that the Chinese children face um, for their transport is between seventy-five and eighty-five thousand dollars. There are often a lot of extra fees that they incur on the way. I had a client who used the bathroom on an airplane, so they said that was an extra $5,000. And then oftentimes attorneys who are working with the snakeheads get paid extra fees as well, which adds to the child's debt. So I have one client whose debt is $115,000. The journeys that people undertake are dangerous journeys. People die en route. Um, and when they arrive here, they can often be held at gunpoint until they pay off the balance of their fees. Some of the girls have been uh, raped on the way up here. I mean, that, that's something that happens fairly frequently. One of my clients was going to have to climb up under a truck and literally hang on to two beams and so she could watch the road go under her. And she was terrified. She said, there's no way I'm doing that. They finally went in, held her at gunpoint, said, you're going now or you're going back to China. She's like, OK, I'm going now. But then when she arrived in the United States, they're like, oh, you delayed us 10,000 extra. The trip took her nine months, and she was starved, malnourished, she had scratches all over, and rashes, and she was terrified of the snakeheads because she said every time she called home, her mother said, they're coming over here and threatening to hurt me and hurt your little brother.然后他们有的是会说跟你说到墨西哥那你们就过来不会跟你说你要去爬山啊有的人不要去坐船啊什么的南墨西哥的时候就那个爬山那里然后就经历了很多因为走的时候就三个中国人然后有两个男生他我们
what debt has been agreed to. And so the child comes and they just know that there's some arrangement that their parents entered into with the snakeheads. And that debt is something that they're supposed to pay off once they get to the United States. Uh, the pressure these kids experience is, can be really very, very traumatic. Their families are saying, you know, you're not sending us enough money. And here this kid is just working herself to the bone, and her family is still there saying, you've got to send money, they're threatening me, or I'm in trouble if you don't send the money. And it's really an incredible pressure on these young people. The journey to America often ends in New York City's Chinatown, in a three-block area known for its specialized underground employment agencies, or what Chinese immigrants call Tia Shuas. The shop holds listings for Chinese restaurants across the country that are in need of workers. A child can obtain a listing for about $50 and then travel to the restaurant's location to start work. Over the last 30 years, several bus companies grew to accommodate the demand for cheap transportation between Chinese communities throughout the country. While the job agencies, bus lines, restaurants, and snakeheads operate independent of one another, they all profit by exploiting the same people. Immigrants in desperate need of money. We have to work until 10, then we close the restaurant, then we take a shower, we come down, and then we cook something to eat. It's, it's like a 12 or 2 o'clock already. And then we have to go to bed that time and get up in the morning, and then we keep working. Just work, sleep, eat, work, sleep, eat. When a white college kid gets a restaurant job, you know, they have protections, they can take breaks, they're not being screamed at or hit by their bosses, they're not, their documents are in their control, you know, in, in these scenarios, it's not necessarily that the work is the worst work that's ever existed in the world, it's the conditions upon the work and it's the lack of a free will that the children have. <laughs> I have clients who have badly injured themselves on the job because they're cutting their fingers open with sushi knives because they are 13 years old and they don't know how to make sushi or they have bubbles on their skin from burning themselves with hot pans and when they take a break, the boss screams at them. Anything that the owner of the restaurant tells you to do, you do. And in accordance with Chinese culture, that's how kids are raised. They don't question anything um, that they find suspicious, or if they're suffering, they learn to swallow it and not bring it out. Put the matches on the floor and then just sleep. There's bugs everywhere, like flying in the in your room. It was gross. There's like bugs everywhere. The child herself, they don't usually know, you know, how long they're gonna have to work, what it is that they're working off. 
um, or numbers will be thrown around, but a lot of times they don't even realize what that bottom line number is, and the parents are hesitant to tell them. So I have some clients at this point who have been working and paying off debt for six or seven years, and I continue to ask them, well, how much do you have left? And they say, my parents say it's still around seventy or $80,000, which just doesn't mathematically make sense. Most of my clients send money back to their parents, and then their parents say that they're paying the snakeheads. But again, most of my clients have no idea how much the debt actually is or how much they've paid off. So the level of, again, ignorance, it's really keeping the ch child in the shadows and it allows for additional exploitation. And this comes back to the Chinese culture and how we're expected, and I even feel it you know, in my own personal life, we're expected to provide and, and give back to the family, especially to the parents. And uh, money is a big part of that. Especially as second children, um, they're considered to be a burden at home, at, in their home countries, um, where they, their parents are required to pay fines or, or, or maybe bribes to local officials and just in order to keep them out of trouble due to China's one-child policy. Growing up with that mentality that, you know, you are a burden to your family um, gives you a very high motivation to want to be, like, a useful and productive valuable member of your family and this is like the one chance the one way of being able to do it is to be you know sent to the US and to help support the family back home what happens if you don't pay back your debt you get big big, big trouble if you don't pay they don't tell you what happened but you should know that if you don't pay them they go to your house break your windows break your doors throw your things away take your things what's your plan to pay it back I don't know anybody who's ever paid it all back of my clients. That's why we see a lot of these children later on in their lives turning to sex work. A lot of Chinese sex workers who you talk to, this was the beginning of their childhood. The restaurant lives are so horrible. The conditions are so exploitative that they, oftentimes someone says, you can work in this massage parlor and you can make a lot more money. And then massage parlor turns to sexual activities. They just become so desperate to find some way to pay this off. The notion of moving a child so that they can go and work somewhere is kind of intrinsically problematic. When it's a child, uh, you know, without the, the, the wherewithal or the judgment or the freedom to make those kinds of determinations, and, and I think also arguably without a really solid understanding of what those risks might involve before they ever leave their village in the first place, I think that you have uh, someone who, you know, more often than not, is going to be um, a victim in a fairly straightforward sense that uh, that often with the adults who are transported by snakeheads, you don't. Beyond the kitchens, the living conditions, and even the immigration courts, the snakehead debt is ever-present. Should a child qualify for legal aid or a green card, they will still have to pay off their debt to smugglers or loan sharks. Even if the children manage to pay off this debt, they remain trapped, bound by filial piety, to work and send money home to China. You explore all different kinds of options uh, that they might have. So you're going through all the different visas, T visas, U visas, you know, asylum um, as an option, special immigrant juvenile status as an option. Special immigrant juvenile status is a special status that would allow unaccompanied minors to be able to stay here uh, due to the fact that they've been abused, abandoned, or neglected in their home country. And it would not be in their best interest to be returned to their home country due to their home or family situation. Without that law, there would be absolutely no hope and no way for these, for these kids to escape from their, you know, their situations. So the Chinese youth, it's pretty easy why they shouldn't be returned to their country of origin because they are victims of human trafficking. The Chinese government doesn't give a lot of protections for victims of human trafficking and the possibility of their being re-trafficked should they be returned to their country are pretty high. For T visas, however, the young person does have to comply with law enforcement and obviously because we're talking about an international mafia-like organization that's that's a huge risk for a lot of young people which they're unwilling to take. The really tragic thing about these cases is they're sent to the United States and nothing gets better. I mean they're away from the abuse and I definitely have clients who describe this as being better than what it was but it's really hard to find the hope for a lot of these kids. <laughs> Uh, 
是有钱人的天堂，没钱人的地狱。As an advocate, you want to you want your kids to eventually end up where they want to end up and be happy and be able to go on with their lives. It's really about building that relationship with them, so they feel like in the future I could trust someone, and I don't have to live in fear all the time. I don't have to have this really skewed view of society and human nature in general, and that I'm going to be okay. I want to be like a normal child, like a normal American. I'm thinking like I'm jealous of all those people, like normal American people. They went to our restaurant, they eat, mm -hmm. they're making with their family. I don't want to work there anymore. I don't know what to say to them. Then I don't have anything to say to them. They might let me do what they do. 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 But I think... 我已经长大了，我没必要就那样子。可他们让我做的事，我一定会做的。我感觉我们像我们中国人，我们只是为了避难，而不是说飞华来美国。毕竟，如果你在中国，你要签和用签证合法的来到美国，那是机机会是非常非常的渺小。特别，特别是呃，在我在我那一边，就是。基本上是没有一个人可以用利用合法的签证来到美国。What do you see yourself doing, say, five years from now? 五年以后，五年以后，我没有想过这个问题，但是我想，如果可以的话，如果可以的话。我就是不知道自己要做什么啦，<笑>反正就试一试了。The good days are when my clients tell me that they've fallen in love with somebody, or that they have, you know, been promoted at their nail salon, or they get their green cards, or they say that they're mad at their parents. Those days feel really good when they say that they're mad about what's happened, and you get to see. Them sort of take control over their lives again. The good days are when people call me saying they want to help. It's when people volunteer. It's when you feel like there's a community starting to be built around these children. The good days are just when they come in and they just start talking and they say they finally feel like they have someone they can open up to about these things. And it's getting bubble tea on the way back from court, and it's teaching them new pop songs in English, and they teach me Chinese pop songs, and it's it's just about the human relationships that are made because I think that trafficking and exploitation of children is about killing what's human in them, and so seeing what makes them alive is really what makes the good days great. <laughs>